Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, in, indeed, I uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, be the, uh, to, to bring the theologian in, in residence uh, uh, lecture. Uh, th this topic about uh, how history is made and particularly how it applies uh, to our understanding of biblical history uh, really kind of first was stimulated uh, by my time uh, at the Hebrew University. Now, I certainly had uh, been interested in history uh, uh, while in, in high school and in, in college, uh, but um, uh, particularly uh, became fascinated with, with history and, and, and how it was put together uh, while I was at the Hebrew University. Um, when, when I went, uh, my, uh, my dad had kind of joked with me that uh, uh, he, wanted, um, he wanted me to make sure that I didn't end up on the news, uh, because uh, sometimes uh, in, in Israel, uh, they can uh, be up on the news, and not just national news, but worldwide news, and so he wanted me to uh, avoid making history, and he wanted me to avoid uh, making the news, uh, which I was uh, successfully able to, to do. Uh, and it was um, uh, there that uh, I was not just interested in an Old Testament history, um, not just interested in ancient history, but uh, I really began to be fascinated with uh, the different perspectives. So in, in Israel, you know, uh, you know obviously I, I'm you know, coming from a, a Christian background, but then obviously you have uh, many of the, the students from a Jewish background, an Islamic background, uh, you had secular students, but in, in addition, you, you had different uh, kind of political persuasions, cultural persuasions, you had students from all around the uh, the world that were attending the Hebrew University, and, uh, and so it was also fascinating to me when I would ask uh, uh, one of my Israeli students to kind of describe uh, um, Israeli history, or I would ask one of my Palestinian uh, friends to describe uh, uh, history. They, they sometimes would describe the, the same history very differently, uh, and so and it really kind of um, um, awoken in me this um, uh, the different perspectives and the different ways of seeing history and the different ways that people tell their stories. So uh, today, this is not going to be a, kind of a formal uh, academic lecture in which I'm just kind of reading a monograph, uh, but uh, it's going to be a little bit more like a, a classroom um, lecture. Uh, if this was we were face to face, it would definitely be much more dialogical. It would definitely be much more in the way of being able to interact with questions. Zoom kind of stifles that a little bit. Uh, nevertheless, I'm, I'm kind of approaching this through a series of, of questions. And so kind of the, the first question, how is history made? And, and even a little bit, what comes to mind when we think about that question? Uh, maybe for many people, when it, when it comes to mind uh, how history is made, uh, we might think of uh, really the events, kind of changing the course of history or doing something so significant that it really changes the way that the world uh, acts and behave. And uh, so uh, Jesus certainly changed the course of history, even though he never wrote any history. So sometimes when we say, how is history made? We're thinking of the events and we might think of leaders and presidents and kings, but, but also we can ask it, um, in, in light of how history is made as history writing, uh, as how it is constructed, how it is written, how it is put together, how it is framed. And so what, what does it mean to, to make history? Uh, so that can, uh, we can answer that question in a variety of different ways. So in, in, in kind of answering that question, I'm going to add a, uh, ask a kind of a sub-question, and that is how is history like a court case or, or trial? Now, fortunately, I've never been on trial. I hope to never be on trial. Uh, I did get an opportunity to uh, be called for jury duty. Uh, actually, I've been called for jury, jury duty several times. Uh, only one time was uh, selected. So in fact, I was on one hand a little relieved I didn't get selected. On the other hand, a little kind of disappointed that I didn't get to selected. But one time I was selected. Uh, and it, it was really kind of uh, fascinating uh, to be a part of uh, that process. And of course, we've whether you've been on a jury or hopefully you haven't been on trial, but uh, you've certainly seen lots of uh, court cases on, on TV. And so as we think a little bit, so how is a, a court case like writing history? Well, in, in many ways, it, it, it is a lot like writing history. Uh, something happened, some kind of event happened. Um, and so we don't exactly know what happened. Uh, in fact, if we knew exactly what happened, we might not have the, the court case. Uh, but um, obviously, we need to collect some evidence about what happened. Uh, and it uh, might be witnesses. It might be eyewitness testimony. 
Uh, although it gets interesting when sometimes the eyewitnesses don't tell the story the same way. Uh, it might be some visual evidence, if you got some, some video. Uh, but even then, the video evidence sometimes doesn't tell the whole story, particularly if you don't see how it began and how it ended. It sometimes can lack uh, context. Uh, but you do have to rely on evidence. But there's some rules to evidence. Not everything is admissible. In fact, uh, one of the, the roles of the judge is to de determine what is uh, admissible, what is not admissible. So if it's just a rumor or gossip, uh, if it's just secondhand information, well, that maybe that didn't work. Um, but, but another thing that's important for seeing how a court case is like history, beyond just the evidence, beyond just evaluating the evidence, if it's reliable or not, but, but particularly in the American system, and I think there's wisdom in this, in that it's, um, this is not just determined by the judge, it's not just determined by the prosecutor, but that there's actually in the court case, two major versions of history that are told. Using evidence, you have the, the prosecutor is telling one story with the intention of proving that that person is guilty. The defense is trying to use evidence uh, and try it for a particular purpose to defend the, um, the client so that to try to demonstrate that they're not guilty. They have different agendas, different goals in mind, but they have to use evidence. Now, some are gonna emphasize some evidence more than the others. One might wanna ignore some evidence that the other wants to, to emphasize. And um, so I, I think there's actually wisdom in the American system that we, to get to the truth, we're willing to listen to more than one version of history. We're willing to listen to history being argued for, arguing for this, arguing against that, and, and allowing a jury of our peers to, um, not just the judge, but a jury of our peers to evaluate that. And who do we believe? And what, what do we not believe? Who put it together um, to make a compelling story beyond a reasonable doubt? And so we, we, we're not confident that just allowing the prosecutor to tell the story will tell the whole story. We're not confident that just allowing the defense to tell the whole story will tell the whole story. And so there really is this tension that almost to get to um, my more accurate history, to get more to the, the past event, we actually need to hear multiple perspectives, not just one perspective. Now, uh, a little bit of uh, trivia. Uh, if you're in Israel, uh, the prosecutor is the Hasatan. The prosecutor is the Satan because the prosecutor is your accuser and the prosecutor is trying to get you uh, convicted. So I, I don't know how that works on an Israeli resume when you're the Satan, uh, but you've got in a court case, two different perspectives trying to come to the truth. Um, now, we could ask another related question. How is a news report like making history? Well, hopefully that there's past evidence that they're reporting on, uh, hopefully they're gathering evidence. Hopefully they've gotten some eyewitness testimony. Uh, but in a, a similar way, we sometimes can see that there can be different perspectives. Uh, in fact, you turn one news channel on and you can sometimes get one perspective. You turn another news channel on and you can get a different perspective. If it was easy just to immediately get to the truth with the evidence, then probably they would tell the news the same way but they don't always tell the news the same way. In fact, sometimes they can be quite different in the way that they tell the news. Uh, in fact, uh, the first time that I kind of became aware of maybe some of the complexities involved in telling the news was when I was at the Hebrew University. I was uh, writing um, a, a paper. Um, so if we've got any students on this trying to imagine writing a paper without a computer, but uh, going this goes far enough back, I was writing a paper uh, and um, I was looking out my apartment window and there was a park in front of my apartment window. And on that particular day, they were having a peace now demonstration, a Shalom Akshav demonstration. 
not too loud, but you know, you had some people with, um, um, you know, with signs and banners, and I mean, it's a demonstration. Uh, and it was kind of interesting, but not so disruptive that I couldn't work on the, the paper. Um, about a week later, I subscribed to the, the, the international edition of Time Magazine. And so to my surprise, I open up this international um, edition of Time Magazine, and there is a story about that Peace Now demonstration. There's a story about uh, kind of the, uh, this was the first intifada, the first uprising had just started. And so there was this Peace Now demonstration. And so for the first time in my life, I'm reading a news story that I had witnessed with my own eyes. So, it, you know, anytime before, if I watch something on the news, I wasn't there. I'm, they're telling me what happened. If I open up a newspaper, I wasn't there. They're telling me what happened. And so for the first time in my life, I'm now reading this, a news story that I had witnessed myself. And uh, it really raised a lot of questions because in this news story, it talked about how the Peace Now demonstration turned violent. And it talked about how the police kind of rushed in and there was this tear gas going everywhere. And, um, you know, I had my window open looking out at that. And unfortunately, I've been in tear gas. Um, and unfortunately, I sometimes wanted to see things that were going on that I probably shouldn't have tried to, to get to. So I, but I've been in tear gas and it is not a pleasant experience. Uh, it's um, hopefully none of you have ever been in tear gas. I mean, it's strong. I mean, it makes you tear up and you, I mean, it's so strong of a smell, you taste it. Uh, and yet, so there hadn't been tear gas because I had the window open. I would have known if there was tear gas. There wasn't, it didn't turn violent. Um, and then they actually showed one of the pictures with this news story and it showed kind of fires burning and it showed this demonstration and people throwing rocks. But as I looked at the picture, it wasn't even a picture of Jerusalem. It was a picture of another town, Ramallah, to the north of Jerusalem. And so for the first time in my life, I kind of thought, wow, they got that wrong. That there, yes, there was a Peace Now demonstration. Yes, it was in Jerusalem. Yes, there were police there. But boy, it wasn't nearly as interesting as the article made it sound. And so now for the first time, I kind of wondered, well, what about other news articles that I had previously just assumed or pre previously just believed? How wrong do other news articles get it? And then why? Did they, were they that incompetent? Did they just rely on secondhand information? Or did they have an agenda? Were they trying to make it sound worse than it really was? Were they trying just to sell more magazines? Were they trying to make uh, one side look worse than the other side? Did they have a political agenda in telling the story? Uh, and so that certainly um, raised a number of questions in my mind. And even as you're thinking about the you know, news stories, <coughs> you know, one, you certainly have different kinds of news stories. You, you've got um, press releases in which we get to write the news story and they print it. I like those. Then you have investigative stories in which they write. Uh, but then also now this didn't happen here in Tennessee, but this has happened in other places where I, I was uh, complaining about uh, university not getting enough coverage. This was in another place. And they said, well, you guys don't uh, uh, sponsor very much with us. So then it was kind of like, oh, so if we give more money, we sponsor more, we get more coverage. Hmm. So maybe it's not just about always just telling the, the story in an objective sort of way. And so it's, um, I, I think it's very important, almost like a court case, to almost force yourself to listen to news stories from different perspectives. Because it's not just what they say. In fact, one of the most important things is what they don't say. What do they leave out of their story? What doesn't fit the narrative? So very much like in a court case, the defense doesn't want to highlight all the evidence. They want to leave certain things out. So, uh, but... It's, it's almost a little bit like um, uh, a quote I heard from um, about um, uh, uh, Mark Twain. Uh, Mark Twain said, if you only have one clock, you always know what time it is. But if you have two clocks, you're never quite sure what time it is. 
And so I would encourage, listen to more than just one news station. Listen to different kind of perceptions, different kinds of agendas, knowing they have agendas. But it's often in hearing what is left out that you're able to come to a better conclusion, almost like that juror, that better conclusion. What, what happened? What, what, what was that history? I want to look at one, ask one other illustration, kind of this, and that is, you know, how is history like a strikeout? Well, we could ask, what is a strike? Well, a strike can be defined by the ball that's being pitched going across that particular plane. And it's got to be, you know, shoulder to knees, and it's got to be over the plate. And if it's outside of that, it's a ball. If it's above that, it's a ball. If only a portion of the ball crosses that plane, it's a strike. So we can define what a strike is. However, um, I don't know if you've ever watched a um, baseball game. Sometimes the umpire has called a ball when I was pretty sure it was a strike. And sometimes he's called it a strike when I was pretty sure it was a ball. Now, I'm not behind the catcher. I'm in the, uh, uh, I'm in the stands. I have my own particular angle on it. But there's um, sometimes the umpire gets it wrong. Now, you hope the umpire gets it right. You, you want the event, the strike crossing the plane, to match what the umpire calls, but they're not the same thing. Sometimes the umpire gets it wrong, but which goes in the record books? It's actually not what happens, it's what's recorded. It's what the umpire says. So if the umpire calls three strikes, it doesn't matter if the, ball, if the batter thought it was three balls. That baseball player's out because the umpire says. So there's a difference between the event and how that event is recorded. There's a difference between how history is made the event and how history is recorded. Now you hope the ideal is that they match as closely as possible. You hope in a court case, in fact, it would be a travesty of justice if the jury came to a conclusion that was contrary to what actually happened whether that was making somebody, declaring somebody guilty that was actually innocent or vice versa. So as we look at this, we're, we're gonna spend some time thinking about historiography and how it's put together so that that uh, better prepares us for when we begin looking at biblical historiography. So we've already kind of gotten at this a little bit, but there's history as an event and uh, German has actually two separate words and I think makes it easier for us. Um, than English with kind of the one word, but, but history is an event. I'm not going to read through all of these, but it, it is um, um, the actual event that occurred in the past. The problem is, is the past is gone and we have moved on. The only way to get back to that is by records, by sources, but um, many times that's incomplete. We don't always have that information, uh, and sometimes that can be very distorted. In fact, I want to give you um, um, kind of an illustration about memory, because often we rely upon our memory to get us back to that event. Now, memory is a record. It's not the event. But uh, we usually assume that our memory is an accurate representation of that event, but not always. Uh, I was watching, this was several years ago, I was watching a um, kind of a not really a documentary, but I was watching a program that was talking about memory. Uh, and it was talking about how memory grows, not necessarily always fades. And actually this person is giving this lecture in a, at a large university, in a big lecture hall, and you see the, this, uh, the professor behind the, the lectern, in the middle of her lecture about memory, somebody walks across the, the platform, grabs her purse, and runs off the other side. Now this is all, I'm, I'm watching this, okay? Because it's all been recorded. And so I'm watching this. And so she's lecturing, her lecture's interrupted as this person goes across the, the platform, picks up her purse and walks out. She then says, okay, all right, we need to call campus security, but we have this room full of people. Let's first get a description of who this person is. And so she starts off and she describes him, okay, I remember him, he's probably about six feet tall and he had a beard and he was wearing uh, red tennis shoes and she describes him. And then she says, okay, 
what else do you remember about this person? And so some different people kind of chime in on some other things to give a description. You have all these witnesses about this person who just walked across stage, just walked in front of everybody and stole her purse. And so I'm when watching this and I'm thinking, okay, you know, it was kind of quick. Um, I wasn't really intending, you know, I was kind of caught by surprise as this person went across and grabbed her purse, but I was thinking in my mind, okay, what did this person look like? And I remembered the beard and I, he, yeah, I kind of remember him, you know, about six feet tall. I remember his red tennis shoes. Uh, and then uh, after we kind of all had agreed upon the description of this person who had stolen her purse, she brings the person back over, brings the person back out, because of course it had all been planned. And a person didn't have a beard. And a person wasn't wearing red tennis shoes. But I remembered the person with a beard and red tennis shoes. And it really kind of irked me that I remembered it wrong. But then she went on to explain because she was the first one to describe him. And you kind of believe what she said. And because you could visualize, because I could visualize him with a beard, she implanted that. Because I could visualize him with red tennis shoes, that kind of implanted it. And I then confused my visualization of what she said with my memory. And she demonstrated pretty accurately that sometimes memory can be distorted, that sometimes memory can be skewed, sometimes memory can be can grow in time. Uh, and then uh, I've also learned, um, being around universities for a long time, that most people seem to remember things in a way that um, elevates their role but diminishes their responsibility. So usually when I ask if there's a disciplinary issue, a student disciplinary issue, and I ask a number of witnesses what happened, usually their responsibilities diminished in their telling, but maybe their role, if it's good, is increased. So history is an event, but it's not always easy to get back to that event. Uh, in fact, sometimes when we have incomplete information, our minds try to make patterns. They try to make sense of what we see, but they don't always do it right. I mean, it, you know, as simple as when you look at clouds and you see an elephant in the clouds, well, obviously it's not an elephant, but your mind wants to see patterns. Your mind wants to see things. And that works with history as well. As you begin to put to pieces together, begin to connect the dots, but not always accurately. So the history is an event, but then you also history as the account. And the account represents the event, but that account is always artificial. And you always have to deal with some uncertainties. In fact, as, you, as we think about even something that we would hope would be accurate reflection of the event. But if I were to ask you to write uh, your autobiography, if I were to ask you to write down your whole life in one page, well, I hope it would be the truth, uh, but it would, be an art, it would be an artificial representation because quite frankly, your whole life can't fit on a page. It would obviously have to be selective. It would have to select what would be some of the most important events in your life. And it probably would be give more emphasis on more recent events than it would be earlier events in your life. So it wouldn't be uh, an equal representation of every year in your life. It, it would be some of the most significant things. Uh, in fact, um, I don't know if any of you keep a diary, but I, when I encourage you to keep a diary, I keep a diary. And, and I find it sometimes interesting to go back even years before and read descriptions that I wrote down, because sometimes new experiences actually begin to frame how I reinterpret past events, even in my own life. So there's history as the event, but then there's history is the account. So we need to keep that in mind. So when we're reading the Bible, we need to, re or when we're reading any history, we're reading any news or article, trying to keep those two separated in our mind. History is an event and history is an account. And so the kind of the fancy word historiography is basically just that process of investigating and writing down that history. So when we're talking about um, biblical historiography, how did the biblical writers, the biblical authors, uh, how did they put together their history? How are they, uh, how do we understand and 
um, evaluate their account. So uh, I do think it's, it, it's, it's helpful to, to pause for a moment and think about some of the reasons why we study history, because those are also relate to some of the reasons why historians write history, and that's going to affect how they write their history. Why they're writing it affects how they write it. So we, we can look at a variety of reasons. So as you think of reasons why people would write history, uh, maybe one of the reasons is to try to figure out how it actually was. How did it actually happen? And almost use scientific methods in, in, in evaluating sources. And that's easier said than done. But hopefully curiosity. Some are more curious about history than others. Um, like, for example, I'm, you know, um, no, no offense to the folks in, um, in Tennessee, but I was less interested in Tennessee history uh, before I moved to Tennessee. Now I've become very interested and very curious about uh, history in Tennessee. And, and I've, since coming here, I've read the biography of, of Andrew Johnson and Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, and who was born in the county, and, and a whole host of others that, that represent a rich history for East Tennessee. So I'm more curious about that. But then lessons, what, what do we learn from history? What do we learn to do? What do we learn not to do? In fact, I think we have to be very careful that we don't sanitize history to the point that we no longer learn the lessons of what not to do. Uh, heritage, I mean, who are we? Where, where do we come from? Um, you, you can't really separate our identity from uh, our history. I think that it's very important that um, when somebody is going to immigrate to the United States and become a, uh, uh, an American citizen, that a part of that process is actually a test about American history. And the, and the reason for that, I think that that's important is because it is now American history. If they are Americans, then it's their history, regardless of where they came from. They may have also European history, or they may also have South American history, depending upon where they come from. But now they also have American history because they are now American citizens. So, but also we can study history to win an argument. We can study history to prove a point. Uh, governments can give us histories to um, approve government policy. Um, um, sometimes it, um, if you want to um, support Zionism, you can tell kind of history in a particular way. If you're, uh, one, if you're not in support of Zionism, you tend to tell history in another way. So whatever it's, in fact, I, I think it would be interesting. Um, I, I, I think it'd be an interesting exercise to ask um, Republicans, tell me your, tell me about American history. Maybe just a brief synopsis of American history. It might be interesting to, to hear how they summarize American history. Ask Democrats, how do you summarize American history? And maybe they would say the same thing. But maybe they might say it differently. M maybe they view policy differently because they view history differently. Maybe they use history to support or to undermine or to, um, to illustrate the policy that they want. So history is powerful. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, that uh, history uh, isn't just academic. It is a part of our worldview. It's a part of our politics. It's a part of the way that we see the world. And being able, to, and we then expect that our view, our politics, our ideology, our religion is supported by our history. Um, so we have to be uh, careful um, when we are thinking about our reasons to study. M maybe we're seeing a pattern to history. Certainly in Marxist history, they're seeing a certain pattern to history that supports that. Uh, and then as we uh, bring in biblical historiography, uh, we're certainly going to, from a biblical standpoint, think, well, does this teach us not only about society and not only maybe about economic systems, but can it tell us something about God? Can it tell us something about uh, our role in the world? And certainly from a, um, um, the, the Judeo-Christian heritage, the, we, these are historical faiths. Um, the, the Exodus isn't just theological truth, it's it's based in an event. Um, the resurrection of Jesus isn't just a theological statement. There's an assumption that Jesus was actually resurrected. In fact, the theological truth of resurrection doesn't mean much 
if there's actually no event of resurrection. So we, we have a historical faith. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, we have evidence for every part of our historical faith. Uh, in fact, um, <clears throat> if we even, the evidence itself has to be interpreted. So let's say, although this, this wouldn't happen, but let, let's say if we were to find a piece of the cross, although uh, I, I assure you that uh, if you come to Israel with me in, in summer of 22, you can probably find some people willing to sell you a piece of the cross. Okay? Uh, in fact, um, I, probably tons of pieces of wood have been sold as pieces of the cross. No, no wonder Jesus was having a hard time carrying it to, down the Via Dolorosa. Now, I'm a little suspicious that not all those pieces are actually pieces of the cross. But let's say we found a piece of the cross. And let's say we actually had biblical scholars who actually agreed that, it, that yes, indeed, this is a piece of the cross. Let, let, let's say we actually uh, did the carbon-14 dating, and it was actually that old. And, and let, let's say we then found the some blood on that cross. Well, certainly that would support the crucifixion of Jesus, um, but does it ultimately tell us the ultimate theological truth of why Jesus came? Why did he die? I mean, this might tell us that he did die, but it ultimately doesn't tell us the theological reason of why, why did he die? Uh, and so, it is, uh, our faith is a historical faith, but the history and the evidence in and of itself isn't enough for our theological claims. Now, so when we think about um, a historiographical method, I still kind of want to raise some, some particular questions as we approach it. One is, what does the historian bring to the process? So now, now that the historian is trying to tell us what happened, what how he or she thinks it happened, does the historian bring anything to the process? Yes. And the historian's going to bring bias and an agenda. Maybe it's a propaganda. Maybe it's curiosity. So even the very intention, the very agenda of the historian is something the historian brings to the process. And what that historian brings to the process affects the process of bias. And there's a lot of different kinds of bias. <coughs> you have personal and experiential. I interpret events through the lens of my own experience. Um, each and every one of you interpret history in, through your own experience. So, um, uh, like, for example, um, and this is um, um, when I was at the, 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 the Hebrew University, um, my... Um, my money, that was, uh, was my check for being able to stay at the Hebrew University, uh, was supposed to arrive. I had to get there, and then when I get there, the check was there. Well, the check didn't show up, and so um, uh, for a long time. And uh, in the meantime, I ran out of money. And in the meantime, I, I, I ran out of money, and I was basically down to some pita bread and water. And, um, uh, and so fortunately, after about uh, a couple of weeks of just pita bread and water, the check finally came. But during that time, I, I, my experience taught me something because I'd never been hungry before. I had never wondered where the next meal was coming from before. Uh, but as a result, and, and also I, I had never before needed something from somebody else. And so, you know, when I kind of, you'd go to somebody and say, well, can you help me with this? Or can you give me a little money to buy food? And all of a sudden, everybody's, uh, um, everybody was suspicious, almost like I was trying to get something over on them. Um, that experience affects the way that I see other people in need. Now, because they're kind of a, a cognitive part of my brain or even a religious part of my brain that says I should be sensitive to other people in need. But my experience further affected um, other people in need because I can reflect upon my experience. You, you see this actually a lot in the Old Testament. Numerous times in the Old Testament, um, the, the Bible tells Israel to have a particular attitude, and it reminds them, you were once slaves in Egypt. In fact, it should affect the way that you treat the foreigner among you because you were once slaves in Egypt. Their experience, their national experience affected the way that they saw themselves, 
and affected the way that they treated others. So our personal experience is going to bring a bias. Uh, our ideological, political, religious perspectives are going to bring a bias. Now, bias is not inherently bad, but we do need to know that we have a bias. I'm bringing to this uh, a whole series of, of biases. All events ultimately are interpreted. What, what, what does that mean with this event, this data? Because history isn't just a record of facts. It's not just a record. It's not just a, a census record isn't a history. You, you have to take that data and begin to form it into a story, form it into a, a history. And you then begin to try to interpret what does this mean? What is the significance? Um, but there, there is that, that bias. Uh, I, I have found that normally people find what they're looking for. That if you are uh, looking to support a political agenda, you'll find it in history. If you're looking to convict somebody, you'll find the evidence to convict them. If you're, uh, you, you, people usually find what they're looking for. In fact, um, you see this in a lot of research studies. One of the first things I do when I look at a research study is who funded it. Uh, because um, if it's being funded, it usually, it usually affects the results. Not always, and there's a lot of protections, but uh, you people usually find what they're looking for. And it takes great maturity to then realize that you were wrong. Um, now, there's also, I wanna talk just a tad bit about a confirmation bias and the way that that works and the way that it affects the way that we view history, the way that we view news events. Uh, all of us have a particular view uh, and we are going to filter new evidence through our uh, our assumptions and our bias. So if it is evidence that seems to support our bias, we can actually be pretty gullible and accept it pretty quickly. But if it doesn't support our bias, then we get a lot more critical. And we might see that as just an exception or we might ignore it. Okay. Um, you can see this in um, um, certainly in, in, in news uh, organizations. In fact, um, if I were to, if we were all meeting together and I were to give everybody a newspaper uh, and you had a chance to kind of scan through the newspaper or maybe a news magazine. And then I were to ask you, what, what titles did you read? What articles did you read? Particularly if you didn't have a chance to read all of the articles uh, and you then selected what you wanted to read. Um, I would find that most people are pretty selective about what they read that they read an article that seems to support what they believe and they're gonna read it, even though that's what they already believe. And if they read an article and it's like, oh, that's not what I believe. Oh, that's another political party. Oh, that's another perspective. We tend to actually ignore it or explain it away. So if I were to hand out newspapers, then collect them and say, which articles did you read? I would be able to tell pretty accurately what your political persuasion was, what, um, actually um, what your religious persuasion was by what news you gravitated to, by your confirmation bias tells me as much about you uh, as it does um, about the history that you read. So we always have to be very careful about a confirmation bias. Uh, let me give what kind of one illustration of a confirmation bias. So um, I've lived in nine different states. Uh, Tennessee is my ninth, uh, lived in, in Mississippi for many years, love Tennessee, love Mississippi. Uh, but I've also lived outside the South. And sometimes people have particular views and sometimes strange views of the South. Okay. Uh, and so, in fact, sometimes almost comical views of the South. Uh, and you can almost kind of tell you've actually not been there. Okay. Um, and so I remember uh, an example of a confirmation bias. So many years ago, actually, when I lived in Texas, there was a, a terrible shooting uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, and the governor responded uh, on the news and said, uh, this is not who we are. Because it was, I think it was an extremist and it was, a, you know, a, one individual. And I think the governor was right. It's not reflective of who Wisconsin's are. This is not who we are. It is not like we are Mississippi. 
And I thought, what in the world? This didn't happen in Mississippi. But you then kind of, uh, almost with your confirmation bias, you excused that this isn't who we are, but now threw it on somebody else. Uh, and so um, sometimes if people have particular views of the South, they're very quick to ex uncritically absorb information that confirms their bias. Or if they see information that doesn't seem to fit their bias, they then it will ignore that or find ways to explain it away. So the historian brings bias. And the better we can figure out what that bias is, the better we can analyze it. Now, sometimes that bias is unconscious. In fact, the most insidious biases are the ones that we're not even aware of. But a part of that bias as well is a worldview. We have particular ways in which we think the world works. Uh, and so particularly when we begin looking at biblical historiography, we're going to see that there's a particular kind of worldview. Well, how, do, how does cause and effect work? What, what, are, what, what, what are causative effects? Does God play a role? Um, are the, is it possible for, for miracles? Did Jesus multiply the loaves? Is that, that's a miracle. Well, that requires a particular view of the world. And if somebody doesn't believe that that's even possible or that that can... Uh, um, then that is, uh, is going to affect it the way that they view that. Well, we can look at a, a variety of causal factors, uh, whether it's race or economics or technology. These are all causal factors. As we look at our cultural perspective, so having lived in the Middle East, there's a certain cultural perspective. There's a Western perspective. There's an Eastern perspective. And these things affect the way we view the world, the way that we affect, uh, affect the way we view reality. And if we view a reality in a particular way, it's certainly going to affect the way that we write our history because we expect to write our history in the way that we expect reality to be. Also, our place in history very much affects. So um, when, when I have, um, sometimes read stories about or books about the historical Jesus as they try to determine what, how Jesus actually was, unfiltered through the Bible, what I almost always find is that uh, even without looking at the, the date that it was written, I can usually tell, was this, um, was this scholar a European scholar? Was this scholar uh, 18th century, 16th century, when, whenever? Because um, their place in history affects the way that they view and write history. So there's a lot that the historian brings to the process, and we need to use critical thinking. Uh, when wherever we're hearing uh, history. So how does the historian investigate the event? Okay, so we've already talked about uh, the event and the record of that. So obviously, what sources are used? Uh, and so and I think that's just always an important question to ask. When a news reporter says something, when a historian says something, how do they know? Just because they say it, how do they know? Um, what do you know? And I'm always a little cautious when it's um, everything's based on anonymous sources. Well, this definitely happened, and I can't tell you how I know, but you just got to trust me that I know. Uh, I'd be a little critical. How do they know what they know? Um, are there gaps in the research? Um, whether that's intentional or unintentional, or just uh, what information that they, they don't uh, have. So uh, having uh, spent a little time uh, dealing with archaeology, um, sometimes we make, uh, archaeologists can sometimes make grand conclusions on a small fraction of data. So what, what, uh, what, what are the gaps? What, what do we not actually have? Were the sources critically evaluated? Did they critically evaluate the eyewitness? Um, does the historian accurately represent the sources? <clears throat> Because sometimes, in fact, well, this is something that I often find frustrating when I'm reading news sources. They often quickly want to jump to a conclusion, uh, and I'm not so sure they've jumped to the conclusion accurately. So I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've all seen uh, the State of the Union address. And, um, you know, I think it's always good, regardless of the party or affiliation or the president, to listen to a State of the Union address. Um, and although we probably tend to watch more of them if it's our party than we do if it's not our party, but I think it would be uh, better if we listen to, to both. But then there's always a politician or a news anchor afterwards that tells us what we just heard. And sometimes it doesn't even 
seems to be very close to what we just watched. Um, in fact, um, uh, when I was at, at, at William Carey, we, we had a, a number of forums in which uh, politicians running for office would come speak to the students. Uh, and many of the students would sometimes come in afterwards that it was the first time they actually heard a politician articulate a full argument. Because often in the news, they just get a little nugget here and there. Um, in fact, it was interesting to see, um, you know, to hear the whole argument from different politicians and then to hear what was what little nuggets were chosen and you then when you're there you're kind of like oh, wow that really wasn't the way to portray it that really was a very skewed way to portray it so does the historian accurately represent the sources so what is the historian uh did the historian investigate the event how well they do and how has the historian framed the event through the selection of the topic because it's not just what the historian says or doesn't say it's where the historian begins the story. And where does the historian end the story? How is it framed is critically important. So, um, for example, if maybe we were to hear um, uh, a news story about, let's say, um, 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 the Israelis uh, uh, bombing um, Gaza City. Well, that is an, uh, that's an event and a record of that event. But listen to where that story is framed. Is that story framed as a response? Or is that story framed as the initiation? So who's responding to who? Who is retaliating to whom? So uh, how that context is given, how it's framed is very, very important for how we ultimately interpret that particular event, because these events don't stand on their own. They're in a broader context. And so how is that framed? Um, and this is where, I've kind of already alluded to this, and this is sometimes you can only see it in comparison and contrast. So if you only watch one news program, you're not necessarily gonna know what's been omitted. You'll know what's included, but you may not know what's omitted. If you watch two news programs, now all of a sudden you see, man, they didn't even tell this story. This is a big story on this news channel, but it's not even talked about on this other news channel. In fact, sometimes the narrative is what you don't talk about, because if you talk about it, it might undermine your narrative. So you also then see one news organization might frame the exact same event very differently than another news organization frames that event. And I think I would always be careful when um, it looks like somebody has a narrative because they're gonna wanna protect that narrative. And I'd like to tell you that uh, all academic scholars are going to be objective and they're willing to allow their assumptions to be challenged Nope, we got narratives too. Um, and so listen for these things um, critically. Now, how is the story presented? So a couple of things here, because it's a, an account, uh, particularly if it's a narrative, particularly if it's of a story, uh, you're gonna almost see a plot to it. But the more plot, the more artificial that is, the more literature there is. Also listen for characterization. How are the people characterized? How are the events characterized? And sometimes it can be interesting to listen to two news organizations that might cite the exact same fact and characterize it very differently. So uh, an example in current times right now. So is a million vaccines a day good, bad? Is a million vaccines a day success or failure? Is a million vaccines a day aggressive or lazy? Is a million vaccine a plan or not a plan? And so the same data point, a million vaccines a day can be characterized very, very differently. So how are the people characterized? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they evil? They're greedy. 
And so the more you, the historian or the news anchor relies on characterization, the more kind of bias you see embedded uh, into that. Uh, a couple of other things just to, to highlight, particularly then as we start moving towards the biblical history, is that um, uh, sometimes we have different kinds of genres. So like there is, a, uh, in a news organization, you have kind of the straight news, as straight as it can be, but then you have commentator, which actually is a different genre. It's really not the same thing, okay? Or even a, a historical movie that we sometimes get our history from, but it's not actually history. It is, um, it, it is a, um, can be a lot of fiction in that historical um, movie. So we, we have to be very careful. What, what are we listening to and what are the rules to that? So hopefully uh, just this first part of this it has a, uh, made us a little more attuned to critically thinking about the history, uh, the stories that we are told. So now as we kind of transition over to more uh, biblical history and biblical narratives, uh, I think we, we, if we're going to interpret the Bible, uh, we certainly have to give a lot of attention to the narratives. I mean, nearly half of the Old Testament is narrative. So the better we understand the narratives and how they're put together and all the things that we've talked about, the better that we can understand it. It certainly is a major form of revelation uh, that God uh, chose uh, narrative to be one of the main ways that he communicates uh, his truth. Now, has certainly communicated truth through wisdom, has communicated truth through law, has communicated truth for, through a variety of genres, including uh, poetry and song. But stories and his involvement in stories uh, and these events very much are a major form of of revelation, as we've already mentioned, that we have a historical faith that we, we learn about God through our experiences and through the past. So it's important that we that we study this uh, if we're going to understand the Bible. It's also, I think, very important is when we read these historical narratives, because this happened thousands of years ago in a very different cultural context and at a very different time. Uh, that if reading the Bible doesn't feel like a cross-cultural experience, then you're probably not reading it well. If it feels just natural, then probably not um, understanding it well. It Because reading the Bible is a cross-cultural experience. We're, we're, we're coming from a Western perspective, but we're reading primarily an Eastern document. We're coming from a modern perspective, but we're reading an ancient document. Now, God has still revealed himself through that, but to, we need to be aware of, um, um, of what we bring to it as readers and what they brought to it from their experience, their culture, and their time. Now, I think there's certainly a number of advantages when we're looking at trying to understand and interpret the Bible when we're looking at historical narratives. One, it's interesting. It, it pulls us into the action. We're able to identify. Maybe we're able to identify with the, uh, the Israelites. We're able to identify with those coming out of Egypt. Uh, maybe we're able to identify with David. Probably not many of us identify with Goliath, but uh, we're able to identify with different uh, characters there. Um, and uh, so it pulls us into the action. It's, it, it's more interesting. I'm, uh, and I think if anybody who's had, who has kids or grandkids, uh, probably a lot like mine every night, daddy, tell me a story. Daddy, tell me a story. And I, I bet there are a lot of folks because we crave stories. I mean, you turn the TV on, it's stories. I mean, you, you go to the library, it's, it's stories. We are, our minds crave stories and putting those things together. So it, it pulls us into the action. It makes the Bible so much more interesting. It, it also uh, depicts real life. And in fact, in a moment, we're going to see some contrast between biblical history and, and ancient Near Eastern history. One of the things that uh, I think we sometimes don't fully appreciate is um, uh, how realistic the Bible is. I mean, we might almost more expect it to be, uh, to make David always look ideal, to make Solomon always look ideal, to make Abraham always look ideal, and yet the Bible tells us that they made some pretty terrible mistakes. Doesn't always give us ideal descriptions. 
we also begin to, the more we kind of give some time and attention to the biblical history, the more we realize that these are some pretty tough decisions. And there are some real complexities to life and to the characters. And so it, um, it, it communicates an advantage because it depicts real life. It's also easier to remember. We're able to remember a lot of details when we put it in a story. It's a lot harder to remember just random information. So an example of this, uh, I think helps to demonstrate that it's easier to remember. So if I were to ask you, and probably many of you have read through all of the Old Testament, read through all the Bible. If I were to ask you to describe to me the content of Habakkuk, or to describe to me the content of Isaiah, or describe for me the content of, um, let's say, Joel. You might remember some key passages. You might remember some messages. You re might remember a sermon you heard about that. But it's actually not that easy to kind of, wow, Isaiah in its 66 chapters kind of tells it this way. It's not easy. But if I were to ask you to tell me the story of Jonah, well, now all of a sudden it's really easy to tell me what the prophet Jonah is about, because it's in the form of a story as opposed to a form of a, a series of sermons or a series of, a, a, of information. So they're much easier to remember. Uh, in fact, this is one of the reasons why we're, we're, while there has been and we've been facing a pretty strong cultural shift, because for generations, for centuries, the primary narrative that people heard were biblical narratives, the main stories that people heard. Growing up, their parents read them biblical stories. Um, you had people going to church and they heard biblical stories. I mean, uh, our big religious festivals, our big religious events are around stories. Easter is around a story. I I Christmas is around a story. Uh, and they're a part of our narrative and they communicate our values. And they communicate all this. But now, in this generation of students, this generation of young people, where do they get their stories? Primarily from Hollywood. And so the values that are communicated through the stories can be very different. Uh, and so, uh, in some sense, um, Christianity has lost the narrative. Uh, it no longer is the primary source of narrative and stories that this generation hears. Now, um, we're also able to, through the biblical historical narratives, God reveals his involvement and his character, uh, his keeping of his promises, his expectations of values. Um, we, we, uh, we get insight into who God is through uh, the historical narratives, but there are also some disadvantages. Uh, sometimes the meaning can be subtle and ambiguous. So we read the story, and it's an interesting story, but what does it mean? What, what to, because we, if we're not careful, we can overread uh, the story. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes you can, we can allegorize it. I, I was reading a, an old commentary uh, about uh, the tabernacle, and they were talking about uh, trying to give historical meaning to the tents, to the pegs, and uh, and it was quite frankly ridiculous. Uh, essentially, the tents to the pegs for the tabernacle or tents to the pegs to the tabernacle that kept it from blowing away. Uh, and it wasn't really deep historical theological truth. They were just tents that kept the tabernacle from blowing away. Okay. Um, we can also, if we're not careful, uh, we can confuse description with prescription. So, for example, if we look into uh, the story of Jacob, and the story of the patriarchs. As we read about Jacob and the patriarchs, uh, we hope that that's not all prescriptive. Because quite frankly, Jacob is a jerk. Jacob is a swindler. Jacob is a liar. Uh, Jacob takes advantage of his brother. Um, Jacob shows favoritism. Um, Jacob marries more than one wife. Jacob does a whole bunch of things that are not prescriptive for us. Um, but it's descriptive. It, it this is descriptive of some behavior that is not being prescribed. It is prescriptive of some behavior that's actually wrong, prescriptive of behavior that actually is what we should not do. We see some terrible favoritism and the way that it tears their family apart. The patriarchs are not 
the best examples or the prescriptive examples for family values, the way that they hate each other and they sell their brother into slavery. And they're just terrible things that <clears throat> they do. And so we have to be able to distinguish a story in the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us what we're supposed to do, but sometimes it does. And this is where we really have to interpret what is prescriptive and what is descriptive here. And so there are some great advantages to it, but we have to be careful in how we read the narratives that we're not overreading them or underreading them. Uh, it also kind of, where does the story begin and end? We have a lot of little episodes, but where the story begin and ends can, it can very much um, affect the way that we interpret this. So like, for example, are the stories of Rahab and the stories of Achan when Joshua is coming into the promised land and you're, you're coming into the conquest, are those two separate stories or are they really two parts of the same story? So are they meant to be read in contrast? Is, is Rahab, whose people are going to be destroyed, uh, and Achan's, whose people are supposed to be victorious? But, but Rahab has, fears the Lord. Achan doesn't fear the Lord. Rahab and her family survive. Achan and his family don't. So you have Achan who comes from this prestigious family and, and Rahab who is a prostitute. I mean, these incredible contrast. But if you read them separately, might actually miss out on some of the main points in which the story begins and ends in a way that includes them so that you have to read them in contrast. So there's some challenges to reading biblical historical narratives. Also want to, to, for us to think before we start looking at some examples of the biblical historiography. And so next week, we're going to um, look at more examples, and then we're going to look at um, um, into some intertestamental literature and how they use biblical history. But, but right now, we're going to still set a little more context, because obviously, we are reading the Bible in a modern context. But to the first readers read it in an ancient context. And so it's actually sometimes helpful for us to see biblical history when it's in contrast with ancient history. So a, a contrast between biblical history and ancient Near Eastern history is that what we find for the history of the ancient Near East, uh, we don't really have anything quite like the Bible. The Egyptians don't produce anything quite like the Bible. The Assyrians don't produce anything quite like the Bible. The Hittites don't produce anything quite like the Bible. Instead, what you find in ancient history is more, very much more royal propaganda. <clears throat> so when you read some of the episodes or stories about the pharaohs, you, you might have a pharaoh who um, is always victorious even if, and it's kind of interesting reading some of the stories of the, the Pharaoh going against the Hittites, but when you actually then read where some of these battles are, they get closer and closer to Egypt, even though every victory of Pharaoh is an astounding victory. Well, if it's an astounding victory, why is the victory getting closer to Egypt? Maybe because it wasn't really a victory, but the historian would have lost his head if he acknowledged that it wasn't really a victory. Uh, and so very much royal propaganda, very much paid for by the, um, the pharaohs or the, the kings. Th this, was, this was royal propaganda. Whereas in the biblical material, I mean, you've got prophets really calling the kings to task. Um, so in the, in the Bible, in fact, you know, we, we, we say that, uh, of course, you have the expression that uh, history is written by the winners. That's true, but it sure doesn't look that way by the, for, the, um, for the ancient Israelites, because they lost to the Babylonians, and they lost to the Assyrians. So in some ways, it's more accurate that those who write history are the winners. Uh, so, but the biblical history, particularly from a military perspective, is a, a lot of losses, and they're willing to recognize and acknowledge those, those losses. But in the ancient Near East, they always won. In the ancient Near East, it's clearly royal propaganda. And they're usually limited to just the specific events or specific reign and not this broader national history. That's a sharp contrast. Nothing quite like something that goes from the patriarchs all the way into the return from an exile. That broad scheme or scope of history that you find in the biblical material that you don't find 
in the ancient Near East. You're, you're going to find that it's not critical in the way that modern historians are critical. It's not critical in the way that the ancient Greeks were critical, but they are critical of David. And, and quite frankly, Abraham is, is, shows his lack of doubt. Uh, and David, who's a man after God's own heart, is also a man after somebody else's wife. Uh, and so you, you see these real um, criticisms of biblical characters. You see a broad national history that is uh, in contrast. Another thing that is um, <coughs> a, a little different that we, helps us to understand it is that um, ancient history wasn't purely cyclical uh, in a kind of more technical sense, but, but there was more of a, 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 a cyclical element to it. Um, and you know, the religious calendar has a cyclical element to it. The, um, uh, our, um, um, the liturgical calendar has a cyclical element uh, to it. Um, the, the judges in the, in, the, in the book of Judges, it has a cyclical element to it. The festivals have a cyclical element to it. The seasons have a cyclical element to it. Uh, that nothing new under the sun. It's really more of a, a modern concept of, of progress, that things are getting uh, better. But part of that sense of progress, that sense of going somewhere, actually is derived from kind of the biblical material, where you have a, a promise and fulfillment, where you have an end times, where you have uh, the, the sense of history going somewhere. Uh, so the biblical material is cyclical, but it also has some linear elements to it. Now, clearly, in both the ancient and in the biblical, you've got divine involvement. That uh, in the ancient, you're going to see that earthly battles were very much described as representing cosmic battles. That Assyria destroying Babylon was not just a, uh, the Assyrian military destroying the Babylonian military. It was the Assyrian gods defeating the Babylonian gods. So it was very much described in, in cosmic ways. When we look at um, uh, many of the oldest stories about the ancient world, they're often mythologies, not really histories, uh, often stories about the gods uh, than they are about um, uh, the people here uh, on earth. Now, we're going to see that clearly they saw their gods as involved, and you see that in the biblical material. Uh, but you also see in the biblical material, God's not just involved, God is Lord of history, not just a participant uh, in history. Uh, I want to just look uh, just briefly at the, the, the Meshestile as an example of uh, kind of ancient Near Eastern history. One, it fits on the stele. So it's not like the whole book of First and Second Kings, uh, but it fits on a stele. So very kind of episodic, very much related to a particular uh, king. But it also gives us some insight in the way that they viewed the world, the way that they viewed divine involvement. And so this is a part of the text. Thank you. Part of the text of um, the Meshe Stele. So I am Meshe, son of Chemosh, king of Moab. And I have built this sanctuary for Chemosh and uh, Karkach, a sanctuary of salvation. For he saved me from all aggressions and made me look upon all my enemies with contempt. Omri king of Israel. So it's actually one of the few times that we get to hear about a historical event from both sides. We get to hear it from the Moabite side and from the Israelite side. And, and um, Omri, king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab during many days. And Chemosh was angry with his aggressions. And his son succeeded him. And he also said, and I will oppress Moab. Now Omri took the land of Madaba and occupied it in his day, and in the days of his son, 40 years. And Chemosh had mercy on it in my time, and I assaulted the wall and captured it and killed all the warriors of the city for the well-pleasing of Chemosh and Moab. And I removed it from all the spoil and offered it before Chemosh uh, and Kiriat. And Chemosh said to me, go, take Nebo against Israel. And I went in the night and fought against it from the break of day till noon, and I took it and I killed all 7,000 men. But I did not kill the women and maidens, for I devoted them to Ashtar Chemosh, and I took from it the vessels of Jehovah and offered them before Chemosh, and Chemosh drove him out before me. So even as we're reading this Moabite history, one, it's very episodic. Two, you very much see Chemosh's role uh, in this. 
And uh, if we were to go on with this, we would actually see that part of the reason uh, is not just that Omri defeated them earlier, uh, but that they had upset uh, Kamosh. So uh, as you're reading this, you're kind of seeing that there actually are some similarities, but also some differences between the, ancient, the way that the ancient biblical historians wrote it and the ancient Near Eastern historians wrote their history. Uh, later, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Greek next week. But uh, when we look at the historical evaluation, the biblical historians don't take the time, although we see some of this in, let's say, Luke, uh, but the Old Testament historians don't take the time to really talk about their sources or really talk about how they're evaluating their history. They don't think about their writing of history. The Greeks are really the first ones that start speculating about writing history. They're by no means the first to start telling their stories, um, but they are the first ones to really start thinking about the process and really start thinking about what sources they should use and not use. They're, to really start thinking about divine causation and trying to keep it more attached to um, natural uh, causation. But the Greeks also talk about other purposes for rhetorical purposes. So as they're trying to win a vote in the assembly, they use history for that rhetorical purpose or just simply entertainment. And so hopefully this gives us just a glimpse of some of the ways in which biblical history in its ancient context is similar and different than the way that the ancients wrote history. Now, and now I want us to um, um, look at some basic characteristics of biblical historiography and then some examples. <coughs> Uh, and then I'll, uh, in a, in a, uh, I want to leave about 15 minutes for some, some questions and answers at, at the end. But uh, so next week's going to be much more in the way of looking at some of these examples. So clearly some of the basic characteristics of biblical historiography is that it's theological. Um, and of course, in a, in a modern, from a modern historian perspective, uh, they would uh, not see God playing a role at, at all. But from a biblical uh, historian perspective, obviously that's one of the core characteristics and the core aspects are really God's involvement in history. God is the Lord of history. That God is not just uh, a God of many gods, but God is the God and uh, is Lord of history. Um, that God is Lord of history and being able to project where it's going to go, uh, prophesying that it's going to be uh, fulfilled, but that also that God's justice governs and affects the way that history is going to work out. It's not just about uh, the strategy of David. It's, it's not just about uh, uh, the, the strength of Samson. It, it is, it, it's also about God's justice. And so when Israel disobeys, um, they're going to be punished. And not just uh, because they lost economically or they lost militarily, but because of God's justice. So kind of almost overriding this kind of theological paradigm is this sense of divine retribution. You're going to see this in the wisdom literature. You're going to see this in the Psalms. You're going to see this really kind of throughout the historical narratives is this sense that God blesses historically, God blesses those who obey him, and God punishes those who disobey him. And then you're able to then use that to interpret events. So if Israel is being what looks like punished, well, why? Well, they must have done something wrong. If Israel is being blessed, well, then why? Well, they must have been obedient. And so it's not just a cause and effect that if you obey, you'll be blessed, but also then if you look at somebody's condition, a, a condition of blessing, does that mean that they are obedient? Or a condition of punishment, does that mean that they have been disobedient? But then the Bible takes a much more nuance than just that simple formulation. In fact, the whole, book of Mo, uh, the whole book of Job is wrestling with that. Well, Job is blameless, not sinless, but blameless, and yet his condition doesn't seem to match the cause. We know the effect, but what was the cause? Was it really that he was worse than his friends? Was it really his sin that led to this? Uh, and so the Bible very much wrestles with this overall framework to history, divine retribution. Uh, but then also really um, um, explores and deals with uh, how that's fleshed out in, in real life. So let's take a look at some examples of um, kind of the divine element of, of this. <clears throat> One of these is going to be Elijah at Mount Carmel. So in, in 1 Kings uh, uh, chapter 18, um, just kind of the, the brief overall story, we have 400 prophets uh, 
450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, uh, and you have the one prophet uh, of Elijah. Uh, and there's this whole contest there at Mount Carmel. Um, and so, and it, and it, it really boils down to uh, a question in Elijah's mind that's really not even a question in the prophets of Baal and Asherah. For Elijah, Elijah says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Now, for Elijah, this, may, this, is, this, this question makes sense. God or Baal, or really we're going to see through the contest that Baal exists and uh, God exists and Baal does not. Because God is the Lord of history, you can't really have both. For, for uh, Elijah, you had to choose. God or not, you had to choose to accept him or not, uh, because there is only one God. You can't serve both God and mammon. You can't serve both God and Baal, whereas from the perspective of Baal, why not? Why can't you do both? In fact, from the perspective of the prophets of Baal, in fact, most of Israelites even, why can't we do both? Why can't we worship Baal? Why can't we worship Asherah? Why can't we worship Asher? Why can't we worship Ra? Why can't we worship Ammon? Why can't we worship Kamosh and God? We'll give God his due, but why not give him his due among all the others? And so part of this story is to demonstrate that God is the only God, and God is the Lord of history, and does it in a fascinating episode here. <clears throat> now, the rules of this contest are essentially choose one of the bulls, and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So essentially, all right, prophets of Baal, I'm going to let you go first. There's a whole bunch of you. There's one of me. The, what we're going to do is we're going to set up an altar. We're going to put a sacrifice on it, and uh, we're going to put all that together. But really, all God has to do is bring the fire. We'll set up the altar. God doesn't have to do that. We'll, we'll put the animal there. God doesn't have to do that. Um, but we'll just see um, if who lights the fire, so to speak. So those are the rules. Whoever lights the fire is real and needs to be worshipped. And, and from Elijah's standpoint, you got one choice, one or the other. Now, interestingly, this whole episode is set up, but you got to have to know the context. You kind of have to know the history to fully appreciate it. Uh, some you were able to just pick up immediately. One, it's a little unfair for Elijah that they get to go first. So kind of like at a football game, you usually want to receive the ball first, but they get to go first. And they get all day long. They get all day long for Baal to light the match. Uh, the location, Mount Carmel, to a modern reader, that may not mean anything. But in the ancient world and in ancient Baalism, Mount Carmel was a high place. It was a bomot. Uh, and Mount Carmel was not just any place. It was a place that where Baal was worshipped. Uh, it was a place where um, the storm god was worshipped. So in some sense, it's home field advantage for uh, the prophets of Baal. The nature of the contest, fire from the sky. If Baal is the god of the storm, if Baal is able to bring thunder and lightning, then certainly this is what he should be best at. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily expect... Um, the god of the storm to move a mountain, but you certainly could think that a god of the storm could bring a lightning bolt. So it's the very type of thing that Baal, if anything that he's good at, this would, should be what he's good at. Well, the number of prophets, 450, or really we can say uh, 850 to one. Can you imagine playing a football game in which you got one player on one side and you got 20 on the other side? It's an unfair contest. The condition of the sacrifice that they give all day to chant and cut themselves and appeal to, to Baal. But then Elijah makes it even harder for himself. He drenches his sacrifice. He drenches his altar with water three times, so much so builds a trench around it and that water flows up, uh, flows over and fills up the trench. So this should be as easy as possible for Baal and as difficult as possible for God. Uh, and yet, the point that Elijah is making that only God is real. And so ultimately it's unfair for the prophets of, of Baal because there might be a bunch of the prophets, but there is no Baal. So it doesn't matter that they think he is in the image of a storm God. Well, he isn't. 
it, it doesn't matter that this is the home field advantage. Um, it's not really where he lives. And so the point of this, in a sense, story, the point of the episode was so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. So I, I highlight this is an example for a couple of reasons. One, <coughs> uh, you see in this particular story an emphasis upon God is the Lord. Uh, we see that his power, we see his intervention, but then there also is a theological and moral um, purpose to this story, so that you will know that God is Lord, and so that you will respond to that historical truth or that this episode by turning your heart back to him. And the very question that was asked to the begin, beginning, choose Baal or choose God? Well, choose God because he's only, and turn your heart back to him. So that was obviously a message, not just to the folks of, of, of Baal, but the hearts of Israel to turn their hearts back. So in that story, we see some interesting characteristics about biblical uh, historiography. Uh, another story, just a couple of uh, uh, chapters later. This is a story about to King Ahab, uh, of who is about to go into battle against the Arameans. <coughs> and so he um, uh, calls together the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, and as, before they go into battle. Jehoshaphat says, should we inquire of the Lord? Uh, should we uh, ask uh, if we should go into battle? Uh, so part of the worldview is that this war isn't just about kings and military and generals, uh, but is it God's will? And so they inquire of the Lord, and they bring out 400 prophets of Baal. There, boy, there are lots of prophets of Baal. Uh, but Jehoshaphat well, not just prophets, but is what about, is there a prophet of the Lord? And so the prophet Micaiah. Now Ahab, the king of Israel, doesn't like him at all. In fact, he says, I, I find it almost a little humorous. Ahab says, I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. So, you know, almost sometimes like the news media, Always say something good or always say something bad, and the king doesn't like it. The king wants the prophet to support. Um, and so um, now there's another prophet, and you got um, a false prophet, Zedekiah, and basically says, yeah, this is God's will, and yes, God's going to bring us great victory. But Micaiah um, actually gives a, initially a sarcastic uh, response, but then says, no, he prophesies, Ahab and your army is going to be defeated. And in spite of Ahab taking precautions, uh, in fact, not dressing like the king uh, and actually trying to hide that he's out there. Um, but we see that Micaiah prophesies how this is going to end, and it ends that way. So uh, in the biblical history, from the his biblical historian's perspective, God isn't just helping out. God isn't just providing strength. God isn't just stronger than the God of the Arameans, but that God is able to determine who wins and who loses. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they don't still fight the battle. Uh, in fact, uh, you, as uh, Joshua is going into the promised land, they prepare their, their, uh, their supplies. They send spies into the land. They, you hear about their strategy. You hear about all these things they do. So there's a, a very important role that the people play. And yet at the end of taking Jericho, we see that God receives the credit. So there is this, in the biblical material, this assumption that people have an important role. Nobody just sits back and prays for God's angels to, to do this. So you see this expectation that people play a role, humans play a role, human causation, and yet God plays a role in this as well, and God is able to secure and is able to determine in prophecy and fulfillment what's going to, to happen. And so there is an assumption by the biblical historian about God's role in history. Um, we have just um, a little bit of time before we... Um, um, before we <coughs> move to a time of question and answer. But I want to at least introduce this part. Uh, and this is, uh, and we're going to talk later next week, we're going to talk about kind of a, two different versions of Old Testament history. 
And this, um, and part of the version comes out of the book of Deuteronomy. And then we're going to see that a later historian writes the story in light of what is written in the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, in Deuteronomy 17, it tells us what the Israelites should look for when they get into the promised land. In fact, uh, Deuteronomy 17, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, and you've taken possession of it, and you've settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king of the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers, and do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire a great number of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, do not go that, back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. And when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. And taken from that of all the priests who are Levites, it is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord as God and to follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he, is in this, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over the kingdom of Israel. <clears throat> so here in the book of Deuteronomy, we have uh, an important teaching about what kind of king they should have. Now, it, interestingly, it doesn't talk about economic experience. It doesn't talk about political experience. It doesn't talk about military experience. There's a whole lot of things that it doesn't talk about uh, that you might expect um, somebody to talk about when they say this is the kind of king that you're looking for. So if you've ever been on a search committee, if you've ever had to hire anybody, you're looking for certain qualifications. Uh, these might not necessarily be the qualifications you were looking for for a king, but this is what Moses says. When you get in the land, this is the kind of qualifications. This is what you should be looking for. Now, so we're, um, next week, we're going to come back and start here. Uh, but in the meantime, I want you to think about um, who of all the kings of Israel this sounds like. Of all the kings of Israel, who, um, um, so in fact, uh, so in this, so the king must not acquire a great number of horses, okay? Of all the kings of Israel, who acquires the greatest number of horses? Of all the kings of Israel, who acquires the most number of wives? Of all the kings of Israel, who acquires the greatest amount of silver and gold? You might already be coming to a conclusion. But is that what the king is supposed to do? Is, is the king, when you get a king, is this king supposed to have the greatest amount of power? Because the greatest horses essentially is, a, is, is representing military power. Is that the sign of a, the king that God wants, the, the strongest militarily, the wealthiest? And at that time, the status of having um, the, the royal privilege of having all these wives. But Solomon is the one who has these. And normally we kind of might even think, well, that's a good thing. Is that that's blessing? Military power is blessing. Wealth is blessing. I'm still not so sure having lots of wives is a blessing. I'm very happy with the one wife I have. And I think it's a, but, and yet now all of a sudden it's given us a paradigm. It's given us a filter to interpret the reign of Solomon. In fact, if we read the story of Solomon without reading this paradigm, we might misread it. We might miss the point that the author is actually trying to communicate in the narrative. So next week, we're going to come back and we're going to start with Solomon. And we're going to see how does Solomon compare to this paradigm? Does he do the things that this theological paradigm in Deuteronomy says the king should do? And does he not do the things that he's not supposed to do according to this paradigm. This paradigm helps us to interpret the historical narrative. So uh, I wish we had more time to finish this, wrap this up about Solomon, but I do want uh, you to have an opportunity for uh, some questions. So I, I think um, you can
um, put those in the chat. And uh, Nicole is uh, uh, looking at some of those. Uh, and when she says raise hand in, in Zoom, you there, you have actually have an option where you can, even whether your camera's on or not, to kind of raise your, your hand. Uh, and we'll try to facilitate this, whether through reading the, uh, the, uh, the question uh, or um, by you being able to, to ask it verbally. But uh, Nicole, do we have any questions written out? Uh, so far, we do not have any listed oh. in the chat room. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Do we have anybody who wants to raise their virtual hand and, and have a verbal question? And then uh, Nicole should be able to unmute you for that. Well, I assure you, if we were doing this face to face, we'd have a lot more questions. So well, I'll tell you what we'll do is I'll go ahead and I will start uh, talking about Solomon here. Uh, but uh, Nicole, uh, feel free to let me know if we have some questions that come in and then we'll go ahead and, and address those. But in light of no questions, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of move on. So we have this theological paradigm that's going to help us to interpret the story of Solomon. Dr. Hummel. Yes. I have a question. We got a question. All right. Yes. Uh, Miss Melanie Narkowitz is asking, how do you tell when you read historical things? Um. So how do I tell when I read historical things? Um, so um, if I understand the, the, the question uh, right, so part of it is going to be asking some of those questions that I asked at the very beginning, okay? So how does the historian know what the historian says? So if the historian's just telling us a story, uh, then that makes me wonder, is this historical? A another thing that can sometimes help me know if this story is historical is the more stories you have coming at it from different directions, uh, or let's say um, uh, from an archeologic, archeological perspective, um, do, is there some physical evidence that um, provides some evidence that these stories happened? Um, was there an ancient Jericho? Uh, was there an ancient Jerusalem? Uh, was there an ancient temple? Now, we're going to find out pretty quickly that sometimes it gets complicated and sometimes it's harder to find that evidence than, than we think. But sometimes we can know if something's historical or historically accurate. When we begin to ask those critical questions about sources and we begin to see if it's confirmed, now that may not tell us 100% that it's accurate, but at least uh, asking those questions uh, help to put us in a better position to know whether this is myth, whether this is gossip. And in fact, uh, I think we've all seen in, um, in, in recent times, although I think it's not just recent, uh, sometimes in social media, we can see a story that's posted. And if it, is, um, if it sounds ridiculous, it might be. Or if you have a negative view about another group or another political party, and it just feeds in just perfectly what you already thought about them, Hmm, that may or may not be true. And so if it looks like it's feeding right into your confirmation bias, we need to at least ask some questions. Is that right? How do they know that? Is that, uh, uh, is that, um, is that reasonable? Um, so sometimes people on social media embarrass themselves when they too quickly uh, accept a story or too quickly accept a narrative without asking some good critical questions. So that's actually a very good question. Uh, how do we know if something's historical and not just fake news? And it's sometimes not easy to know until we start asking some of these very questions. I have another question for you. Okay. When you come across something that you think isn't correct, what do you do? Okay. And that is from Dakota Hammonds. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Dakota. <clears throat> so um, I'm more likely to find out uh, something that, uh, now, now read the question again, something that I think is wrong or? The question reads, when you come across something that you think isn't correct, mm -hmm. what do you do? Right. Um, so uh, now if we're at a, um, um, if, if we're at a, um, a movie and it's a kind of a historical movie, then I really annoy my wife. Uh, because uh, I then let her know all of the things that I think are wrong with that, uh, that, that history. Um, so maybe not do that, uh, but 
So if I if I think it's wrong, uh, then I you know one why do I think it's wrong? Now do I think it's wrong just because I want it to be wrong? Do I think it's wrong because it's not fitting my narrative? Okay. So uh, so I need to ask because it might be right, and it might be right even though I want it to be wrong. Okay. And so sometimes that's going to be the uh, even kind of denominationally. So, you know, sometimes we have a particular denomination and we read a passage of scripture and it doesn't seem to quite fit nice and neatly, okay? Uh, and so we sometimes ignore it or we don't preach it. In fact, if we're not careful, we can preach certain books and not other books. We can preach certain passages, but not other passages. And that's a clever way of sometimes ignoring that. But, but I, I would say that... Um, Really, when we come across something that we think is wrong, we need to filter through it. Is this be my confirmation bias? Because we might need to be just as critical about something that I think is right that is supporting my confirmation bias. So there, but there, there also needs to be some humility. How do they know what they know? But how do I know what, what I know? Um, and so, um, in, in fact, it is um, in science, when facts don't fit a theory, when evidence doesn't fit a theory, that's actually a good thing. That's an indication that we need to start looking more at our theory. Um, so uh, sometimes um, when we run across something that we think is wrong, um, upon further investigation, we might define that it's right um, or uh, upon further investigation, we're even more confirmed that it is wrong. Now, then there's an, another thing here, and this is um, sometimes, let's say, related to the biblical material. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we are um, uh, looking at the biblical material in a different way, and sometimes the biblical material, in fact, we're going to look at some examples that the Bible, when it's telling stories, sometimes uses poetry, and sometimes describes events in poetic ways. And, and maybe in a literal way, it's not right. But in a poetic way, it, it is. And so let me give you kind of an example. So uh, of kind of sometimes poetic language that we would be wrong technically, but poetically it's right. So, um, so let's say if um, walking along the, the beach with my wife and I say, oh, the, um, the, 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 your eyes are as beautiful as the sunset. Uh, and it, my wife, uh, being a science teacher, could respond and say, you're wrong. Scientifically, the sun doesn't set. Sun doesn't set. Sun doesn't go around the, the earth. It just looks the way that it, like, it goes around. The, uh, but my statement that your eyes look like the, they're as beautiful as the setting sun was not a scientific statement. I was not trying to make a, a case about... Uh, um, gravitational pull and about uh, the movement of objects in space, I was just trying to make a poetic statement that, boy, what appears to be a setting sun, which we all know it really isn't, is as beautiful as my wife's eyes. So, so sometimes um, when we see something that's wrong, it, it may be what were they trying to communicate, and it may be wrong in a different way than we think. Dr. Hummel, I have a question from Sarah Van Dusen. Mm -hmm. Her question is, in your opinion, is the writing of the Bible inspired and historically accurate? Yeah, so those are two, two, um, um, so do two different things. So part of my bias is I do think that the, the Bible uh, is inspired. Uh, I do think that we learn uh, some, I do think that God uh, reveals himself um, through different, uh, through through poetry, um, through uh, through history, um, so I, I do. So that's a that's a part of my bias, and that's a part of what uh, I, I'm coming through with, with this. Um, a part of my bias is I, I believe in the the, the resurrection. Now that's that's a miracle. Um, having actually I actually taught biology for five years, so I know that by that resurrection is impossible. Uh, I know that dead people don't come back to life. Now I know people can be resuscitated. But uh, resurrection is impossible. Um, and from a biological, scientific way, I know that. I, I think we all know that. Yeah. But I also, in a part of my bias, thinks that, uh, that God can, can do the impossible. Now, 
related to the second question about uh, historically accurate. And I think um, uh, this is where um, coming back next week, um, I think it's going to be really important. In fact, I think this is an important part of the way that the Bible tells its story in ways that sometimes give us um, a modern, um, in a modern mindset, the heebie-jeebies. Okay? In the modern mindset, we want to have one clear uh, story. What is the right story? What's the truthful story? Okay, and anything else is, is wrong from that. And yet the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, takes a more nuanced, and I would say more sophisticated, um, approach to historical truth and accuracy. Uh, for example, the Gospels, there are four versions. They know there are four versions. They put four versions right next to each other. Because a part of the implication is, is that the story is bigger than Luke's perception. The story is bigger than uh, Matthew's perception. That the story is bigger than any one way of telling it. And so I, I think that all four are inspired. And yet I think they're all four inspired together. And because they're actually side by side, they raise some questions that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so the, the biblical material is, is able to see things in tension and different versions of the same story right next to each other and still see them as truth. We're going to see, ne particularly next week, that there are two major versions of Old Testament history. And I think wisely, the New Testament resisted the temptation to uh, merge them all into one story. And I think the Old Testament wisely resisted the temptation to try to merge two versions of Old Testament history into one. So when we talk about historical accuracy, we, we know that uh, they are kind of, they kind of see it a little differently than we do when we're trying to find almost in a scientific way that allows only room for one version. The biblical material intentionally and quite aware has multiple versions of the same story. Well, let me give a, an example that's not a historical example, but is an example of the way that the Bible allows two things right next to each other, that if read literally would be a contradiction. So in Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 25 or 24, uh, verses 4 and 5, <clears throat> essentially says that uh, answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be, um, uh, answer a fool according to his folly, or um, he will not change his ways. That's a uh, very rough again. Okay. But essentially, you're told to answer a fool according to his own folly, okay? That makes sense. Don't answer a fool according to his own folly. It's an, it's an imperative. Don't do it, okay? And it even gives a reason why, okay? But then it says, don't answer a fool according to his own folly, or you'll be just like unto himself. Well, well which is right. Answer a fool according to his folly, or don't answer a fool according to his own folly? And are we kind of like, wow, man, the, the, I can't believe that they didn't even notice that those two verses were right next to each other, okay? One must be right and one must be wrong. Or is the Bible taking actually a more sophisticated view that they're both right? It depends upon the situation. That depending upon the situation, it's wise to keep your mouth shut. And depending upon the situation, it's wise to speak up. And that sometimes, and it takes wisdom to know the circumstance, it's wise to answer a fool according to his own folly. But sometimes it's wise not to answer a fool according to his own folly, and it takes wisdom to know the difference. So, um, so it, that's an excellent question uh, about um, whether I think it's accurate. But I, I think it's accurate in a way in which the Bible allows for um, multiple versions of the same episode or the same story. Thank you, Dr. And I think we're over time, so we're right at the end here. Thank you. I don't have any further questions listed. Okay. Well, um, I hope I didn't scare anybody off and uh, hope to uh, see all of you virtually um, uh, next week. Uh, so thank you for uh, being a part of this. Uh, it's not quite the same thing as being able to really have that dialogue in a, in a classroom. So very much looking forward to not just next week, but next year uh, when uh, we're able to get back to uh, more face-to-face. -face. In fact, we already have somebody lined up for next year, uh, Dr. Benny Crockett, and he's a, a fabulous and brilliant man. 
Do you want to close in prayer, Dr. Hummel? I will. I will. Thank you. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, once again, I thank you for each and every person here. I, I, I thank you for their desire to, uh, to listen and to know and to grow and, and to be stretched. And, and Father, I, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for what you communicate uh, through these stories. God, I pray that you will help us to ask good questions. Help us to be, uh, be humble in, in what we hear. Uh, but God, I, I thank you uh, that we can have a relationship with you, the Lord of history. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. And Dancy, I see you. I see my Meridian folks. <laughs>